Okay. Maybe we can do a discussion here. And uh, maybe in the last part, maybe it's that. I don't know. Do you want do you want to have a break? <laughs> no, it was I don't know. Oh. I think it's better if she finishes and then we, we have a break and then we we can start the discussion. Yeah, I mean I'm not okay. Yeah. Okay, so turning to research on humans and animals. I have to say that, you know, I talked about research I was doing more than 25 years ago, and I had worked with lab rats. Um, I always thought they were very cute. I liked them. But I've always had disquiet about using animals in labs. I didn't do anything terribly nasty to them, but if animals are in labs, they are bred to be killed and I didn't like it, and the disquiet grew. So I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, so I guess that's how I felt my rats were feeling. <clears throat> so where do you turn to from there? We've spent many years being trained in doing animal behavior, uh, and so on. Well, I turned to and have been uh, an instigator in the development of something that's now called human animal studies. Um, I should perhaps explain a little bit about what human animal studies is. It's now got its own journals. It is an interdisciplinary area. Um, and so it's trying to look at uh, what animals mean to us. And that could be all kinds of animals from um, rats in the sewers to laboratory rats to the animals I live with in my household, um, to animals in zoos, to wild animals. How we think about them, our attitudes towards them, how we've represented them historically and li in literature, how they impact upon us. So there is a big literature on the benefits of living with animals. If you live with a dog, you're less likely to get heart attacks, for instance. I'm very glad to hear that, because I live with three. Um, so there's now an emerging literature called Human Animal Studies. Um, and it asks lots of questions. There are many things that we could ask about how we think about um, animals in general. What assumptions do we make? Now, my partner is a native Spanish speaker and she said this will work, so I hope it does. Um, I love this cartoon. She's pinned it on her wall. Um, Matthews, obviously North American scientist, Matthews were getting another one of those strange habla espanol sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and the very fact that they can think it's funny, that, they, 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 that it's weird, strange, is because they simply can't conceive of the notion that dolphins could speak human language. We may yet be surprised. Now, I've talked about, we talk about human animal studies. Um, the word animals in English, or indeed in Spanish, are traditionally in nature. So this is problematic already because that means that if you talk about studying animals, you're likely to think that the person who's doing it is a biologist. Whereas sociology, anthropology, and indeed most of women's studies have tended to look at what humans do. So there is a disciplinary divide in the first place. Animals are traditionally in nature. And of course they're opposed to human. I've just talked about human animal studies. I've been part of setting it up. But that's a problem, isn't it? Humans and animals, as though we're not. That's a problem. We are. And of course there are issues about how we understand this animals. Which animals do we mean? What's interesting about humans and other animals is that there, it's a generic animal there. It means all animals. And it does not differentiate between different kinds. And that for me as a feminist, who's, you know, feminists are quite used to thinking spending a lot of time thinking about how difference is created, and we go and use animals as a generic, that's a problem. 
And of course then, what animal behaviour? And if you, I'm not just thinking that this is something that doesn't ever get into the femi feminist literature, because the slipperiness of the word animal does indeed get into the fe recent feminist literature. Um, Dora's already seen this one. Um, <laughs> This was a, a quote from a recent piece of work by Rosie Brodotti, who's a very well-known um, feminist <coughs> philosopher. And in, in it she writes, The strength of animals, notice it's a generic animals, is that they are imminent in their territories and environmentally bound. Insects and animals mark their territory acoustically, olfactorily, by their own assigned system. Now I've got lots of problems with that. First of all, insects are, are animals. Second, humans are animals. And as for animals and not humans being imminent in their territories, well, I'll turn to Gary Larson to comment on that. <laughs> um, the point about using that Ray Dotty quote, though, is that it, you know feminists and lots of people who are writing in the social sciences do still make recourse to a notion of animals as being simply nothing else but instinct. They have no culture. Now there's lots of evidence that from a number of different species of animals that they do have culture. We just aren't very good at finding it yet. We're not very good at speaking horse, dog, wolf, zebra, whatever. So what I've become more interested in recently is how we think about, or study, or study, that's the bit, it's about the methods. How we think about and study relationships between humans and other animals. Clearly to do that we're going to have to breach those disciplinary divides because animals belong to biology, or do they stay there? I like this quote from Donna Haraway, beings do not pre-exist their relating. She uses the word relatings to mean rather more than relationships. I might have a relationship with the dogs we live with, um, but those relationships are also embedded in a, a huge set of cultural networks. Um, the particular kinds of dogs we live with have histories, which are histories within particular kinds of culture, um, particularly in, in England, actually. Two of them belong to a category called lurchers, which are particularly known in, um, in the UK, more so than other parts of Europe. So there's a whole history of European, etc., moving around, and social class comes into the history of lurchers. There's a whole lot of things. So when Haraway talks about relatings, it isn't just the fact that I can sit down at my computer <coughs> with one hand stroking my dog. It's much, much wider context again. So, relatings, or relationships if you like, in the human-animal literature is seen as much more than individuals. I, Haraway's really more recent work on companion species, in my own work, on particularly on horses, has been trying to emphasize this. It's more than individuals, so we're going back to this context thing again. And it's embodied. Now, I told this, I hope everybody's happy with the concept of embodiment in English. It doesn't translate so well into Spanish. Um, I'll give you an example from the literature on horses and humans um, from an American, uh, Australian, sorry, sociologist Anne Gain. She wrote about the act of riding, something dear to my heart. And she talked about how, how it is something deeply embodied. My body knows before my, if you, do, if you don't mind the dualism, my body knows, long before I think about it, how a horse is going to respond, because I've been riding horses all my life. Um, it is very, it is something, it's a kind of knowledge that deeply written into the cells, the way the nerves and muscles work. And that's what Gaye was writing about when she wrote about the embodiment of riding. That's fairly theoretical. All those kinds of things are writing, all those kinds of pieces of work are writing about relationships at a very theoretical level. 
But I suppose because I did animal behaviour, I ought to go off and I don't know, do experiments or something. Find out practically, empirically, how do relationships between people and animals that they are close to build? Well, you know, I, I'm stubborn or difficult or stupid or I guess I'm a feminist. Um, I have to go and do something that's very difficult. It isn't easy. To begin with, I was looking at these two things. Well, horses' welfare, that's basically what you do in biology. So I've been looking at horses' responses and what, how, you know, what, how horses are best served in particular situations. If people approach them in particular ways, how do horses respond? And back to being my uh, animal behavior scientist self. I also did some research on people's understandings of horses and the horse cultures they were in. But you can see already that I, being partly I'm being the scientist and partly I'm being the sociologist of science. I'm using two different methodologies. And I'm, they're not the same project. Oh, that's difficult, isn't it? So I'm stuck. Even though I've crossed divides, I've been a, bio, a biologist who's done some sociology of science, but still I end up doing two different methodologies. The scientific and experimental one, and the one that's kind of more qualitative, interviews with people and so on. Oh dear. So how do we find ways to create a bad one? And in this case, it's certainly not benefiting the horse. Now, this idea of thinking about quality borrows from the work of a, a Dutch ethologist whose work I much admire. Francoise Wemmelsfelder has been trying to do research on animal subjectivity in an agricultural, a scientific establishment, an agricultural college, for a long time. She's had a lot of trouble, as you might imagine, trying to talk about animal subjectivity to scientists who was trained from when they were this big you must not talk about animal subjectivity, it's too anthropomorphic. But she has done it. And what's interesting, I, I, I really love Francoise's work, what's interesting about it is that she recognised that we can all go around saying, you can talk about dogs, if you keep dogs or the cats, there's lots of cats around this campus, we could probably all go around and say, that cat looks happy, that cat looks miserable, without knowing the cats personally. And do you know what? There would be a considerable consensus. And what's more, that consensus would probably match fairly well with scientific assessments of how stressed the animal was or not. So what she's been developing is methods to look at this quality that we can't pin down quite so easily. But it is a quality that we know about in other animals. We can say and agree with each other, there is something there, that animal is happy. And she, she got people to look at pictures of pigs, pigs on farms. And, they, and these were people who didn't know pigs, but they could mostly agree on a personality profile for that pig. There was a consensus. And she, she's used this as a means of working around, working towards thinking about animal subjectivity. We can make some assessments about animal subjectivity, contrary to what I was told as a young student. And she agrees with me, but it, she hasn't done it herself yet, that it ought to be possible to extend this idea of making this kind of overall qualitative assessment of a relationship. Now, people, psychologists do this who are looking at human-mother-infant interactions. You can assess the overall quality and say that that is a mother-infant interaction which is well enmeshed. The mother is very good at predicting and working with the behaviour of her offspring. So there are precedents. And this is what we're trying at the minute to develop. So... That's what I'm trying to do right now, and I'm just going to sum up now in this last bit. What we need to do is to find ways, and I'm speaking as a feminist, I want to find ways of exploring methodologically, not only theoretically, how to explore how animals develop in their contexts, how they are established in networks of relating, 
And what are the qualities of the relationships of ours and theirs? And I want to try to combine, this is where I'm either stupid or very brave or something, to combine the very different methods of the natural and social sciences. I think I could probably only get away with saying I want to do that because I'm now sufficiently old that it doesn't really matter anymore. I'm not doing this for a PhD. If I was, it would be foolhardy. But I'm, I'm old. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to try. And if anybody has some ideas about how we can cross those divides and think about how we can study animals and study people at the same time, I really want to hear it, okay? But of course, this means developing new methodologies, and the dilemmas remain. How can we study the embodiment that feminists have written so much about? Anne Gay talked about it in the act of writing. There's been a little bit of work. Uh, Elizabeth Wilson has drawn upon, uh, done a feminist analysis, drawing on psychoanalysis to talk about um, embodiment and how that can, how, uh, expectations of what's going to happen can change your physiology. We need to do more with that, but it's not something that is well studied empirically. And I don't want to do just only theoretical things. I do want to do some experimental work, some empirical work, find some things out. And how do we move beyond the verbal? Because, of course, I've glossed over it. But if we're doing interviews, a standard for, for a great many sociological studies, we sit and we talk to the person. We may also observe them in an ethnography, but we spend a lot of time in interviewing people. How can you interview a being whose language you do, you do not and cannot speak? I could make a better effort to learn Castellano or do better at learning it, um, but I'm really absolute rubbish at learning dog or horse or even though I've spent a lifetime with them. And more importantly, perhaps, how do we bring together existing methodologies? It is very difficult. It's difficult to get money. It's difficult to publish in single journals. If you do it in one, with one sort of methodology, send it off to the journal, it gets rejected because it's the wrong sort of methodology. It happens all the time, and it still happens to me. And, and these are the questions that I come back to, how do we do research that's accountable? I recently wrote a paper that was a position paper for a new animal, human, human animal journal called Humanimalia. And I wrote about doing research in this and asked this question about accountability, partly with a view to the way that human animal studies is now increasingly becoming taught in universities. So it's becoming part of academia. And I said in this article, sadly, I remember what happened to feminism as it became more institutionalized in universities. It became more theoretical and more removed from the politics of women's liberation. And I don't want that to happen to human animal studies, which still has a grounding in animal advocacy politics. And it's, that's that question of accountability. It's one thing to write about all these things to do with animals, but if, that, if what I'm doing in these studies isn't trying in some way to take animal, the animal's points of view seriously, then I should not be doing it. So I think that is a question that those of us who are working to do the issues to do with animals have to take very seriously indeed. How can we do research that's accountable when we can't ask them? And when, of course, in the legal system of the entire Western world, animals are property. And, of course, how do we integrate the situatedness me as being white middle class, etc., of the knower into doing biology research to do with animals. That's something that we still need to do a lot more work on. And are these feminist questions? You may say to me afterwards, well, you've said a lot about feminism, but those aren't exclusively feminist questions. No, they're not. I think that a good biology 
should be a biology that's looking at context. I happen to think that feminists are amongst those people who have said that context is important, so it's feminist in that sense. So it's partly a feminist question, but it's, they're not entirely. <laughs> so coming full circle, I suppose I started out doing my PhD in animal behaviour, getting involved in the women's movement at the same time. I was working then on uh, animal development and hormones. I've become, I've come round, if you like, to looking at animal behaviour again in connection to humans and human behaviour through this um, trying to look at relationships. And of course, I've moved. I never move away from feminist feminist critiques. I'm always doing them. But it, I put that into a, a wider context of multidisciplinarity and contextualization. Feminism is always there, even if I don't always explicitly use the word in human animal studies articles. So, to conclude, am I swimming between two waters, or am I sitting on the perch? Okay, thank you. Multi-celled organisms. 
and she draws on that. So that, that mixing of DNA that is the very basic level of relatings is part of it. We are, we are not separated out biologically from the world in which we live. When it comes to dogs, it's not only, you know, doggy kisses, but it is also the, the com very complex networks of the, the histories of, for example, colonialism. She talks, for example, about Australian shepherd dogs. There is a whole history of uh, colonial exploitation of Australia, the arrival of white populations there, and what happens to the indigenous people. Um, the, there, there are histories uh, of all kinds of things that are buried deep in the way that we have constructed and bred particular kinds of animals. And so when we talk about companion species, there is a whole lot of things that are coming into that. So it's not just a, a companion animal, the dog by your fireside. There, it brings with it a lot of history. Um, and I, I mentioned very briefly the, the lurchers. We, I, we've had lurchers for many years. The word lurcher in English comes from uh, the word lure, which apparently is an old Roma word, which means thieving. And the old English word cur, so it ought to be lurcher, but it's become in English lurcher. They were very strongly associated with Romani populations um, in England and, and then became, as in particularly in, 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 I think particularly in England rather than the rest of the UK, very associated with poaching, that is the illegal taking of game. So there's a whole other set of interesting rich histories associated with this, this particular dog and therefore with the ways in which they are valued now. So if a dog warden finds a lurcher on the street, there is a very low probability that they will be able to find another home for that lurcher. They, they're not, as, they're pe not so many people want them because they carry with them this history of being slightly associated with an underclass, which I find very interesting. They're, I've also found very interesting doing some research when we were looking for another dog to rehome. Mm -hmm. um, I found that especially amongst those kinds of dogs, nobody wants black ones. Yes, with Labradors, people like black Labradors, but amongst these kinds of dogs, there is a whole website called Black Beauties, just devoted to trying to rehome black greyhounds and lurchers. And then they put a few other ones in the site. And they'll quite willingly tell you, we can't find homes for the black ones. Why? So, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that Haraway is talking about. It's this deep connection of how we understand animals. It's not simply a case of we bred dogs in particular ways to create certain kinds of dogs to suit ourselves. Of course we did. Um, we've certainly bred, I mean, take horses for example, the, the thoroughbred, the racehorse, was bred for the aristocracy, um, out of particular very fast horses in about the 17th, 10th, 17th to 18th century. They became highly associated with the aristocracy in England, certainly. Um, and and that you can see how it traces through into the way that it's called the, the sport of kings racing in English now. You know, it still carries that history of a particular kind of breeding there's a whole lot of things that go into the way we think about animals, and that's why she talks about companion species. It isn't just about breeding a particular kind of dog. It's much more than that. It goes way back into human history. And of course, it also the other idea which I should mention that comes into the way she discusses it is that um, we don't know who domesticated who. It is not Case. Several other people have said this, but Haraway picks up on it. It is not a case that humans suddenly thought, oh, there's a wolf pup, I'll try and get it 
to come down to our fireside, the wolf pup was probably there first. Who domesticated whom over time, we cannot tell. It takes something for wolves to come into human groupings in the first place. They almost brought themselves in, as far as we can tell from archaeological evidence. So there's a whole lot of things that are embedded in there. So what she's trying to say about the idea of relating and companion species is that we mustn't forget that deeply entwined um, embeddedness, really, with each other's lives and histories. Thank you for your speech. And I wonder about the concept of identity and how it's constructed in, from biology and sociology. This concept of oneness and otherness. I trained in ancient history and many archaeologists are working with this construction of the borders of oneness and otherness, this identity. And I don't know, how do you work with this concept from biology? You can speak. In biology, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very, yes, it's very difficult. And it's one of the things that, well, going back to that um, material that Lynn Margulis has worked on, there is a sense in which we are not one. The difficulty for us is it's not just what biology does, of course, it's what Western culture has done, is we have this kind of solipsistic sense that I am I, and I am completely separated out from the, from the rest of the world. And in, um, do you know, have you come across Emily Martin's work on the construction of the immune system? Now that's quite interesting because what she did, she did, uh, uh, one of her best known works was a 1985 book called The Woman in the Body. But this was a, a slightly later work, and I've forgotten the exact name of it, if anyone can remember, please tell me. Where she was looking at how immunology has drawn on particular metaphors. And up to about 20, 30 years ago, a lot of popular accounts of immunology would talk about the body as a kind of fortress, very much sealed off from the world, um, and that you should protect it like that. And so you would, she produces some lovely images from um, popular science magazines where you've got a, a, a body almost represented quite literally as, a, as the parapets of a castle. But that's begun to change, and we now have the idea of the immune system as being something, first of all, which is very much in connection with the outside world. So that's diff very different from that earlier idea. It's much more in connection with the outside world, but, and this is where it gets more interesting, um, it can be tuned up. And don't we all do it? I mean, if someone near you gets a cold or flu, well, maybe I'll take some echinacea or you know, vitamin C, um, anything that we think might help the, help the immune system. Whether or not there's evidence is <laughs> um, And what is interesting about that in her book, she actually looked as well at the way that that idea of tuning up is taken out of biology and exploited by corporate organisations. So they go and they take their executives on training courses, exactly drawing on the discourses of this new, newer version of immunology. And they're using exactly the same words, to tune up your executives so that they can cope better with stress. So it's sort of feeding itself back into how capitalism works, which I find fascinating. Um, but that's an example in one particular area um, of how that, that notion of, of the the sealed offness of the one, the I, has begun to shift. And of course, in, it is true that in biology we, we would generally think about um, the interconnections of, you know, without the information flow. Uh, Haraway writes a lot about that. We'll come back to Haraway. Mm -hmm. uh, writes a lot about that, with, and certainly uh, other people too, in respect to the cyborg idea, the information flow. I'm going to say, though, that I have trouble with that, 
Now, the reason I have trouble with it is that some feminists seem to have taken the idea of information flow biologically as though it, it's so important and that this is what we ought to be writing about. And then I think about animals and I think, whose body gets dismembered ease more easily? Not mine. Animals' bodies are taken apart very easily. And as soon as you have that kind of discourse that talks about body parts being so interchangeable, um, information flows and so on, then it does lend itself, while I, biologically I know it's true that we are a constant exchange, I also want to find a way to hold on to an idea of the integrity of the organism, the one if you like. The one is also the many, but I want to hold on to that idea of the one because I can see, as somebody who's interested in animal advocacy, that animal bodies are already being torn apart in association with this shift in discourse. And that disturbs me greatly. Doesn't quite answer your question, well. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Si alguien quiere preguntar en castellano, que no se corte, ¿eh? Sí. I immediately thought, well, you're talking about consensus and that seems to give some kind of subjectivity to the animals. But the consensus is based on what we, as social beings, think of what happiness is or what sadness is. So we are projecting our own um, notions or concepts of sadness and whatever subjectivity you want to talk about into something else. So the consensus is, is false in that, in my opinion. Sorry. Well, if you're going to play devil's advocate, I'm going to play devil's advocate <laughs> and say that I don't know that you feel the same sadness as me. Exactly. That there is always, you know, in Western, the history of Western philosophy, there is always that level of scepticism. And, you know, you can take different views of it. I think that if we are going to be here as a species and share common social life, we have to try to accept that we have something in common. Whether it's exactly the same, that probably doesn't matter. The way in which I would describe it, a particular feeling, I may well have caused some sort of resonance in you. It may not be the same feeling. It might mean different bits of nerves transmitting, different hormones. But we maybe have, oh yes, I know what we're talking about. And I think we probably can do that with other animals. At least those ones that are sufficiently like us. Um, it's much harder with, I don't know, a snake. I, I couldn't read a snake if I tried. I, I don't have enough to do with them. Uh, I couldn't read their behaviour, so I couldn't read their moods, their emotions. But I think I can read the behaviour of the animals I am most familiar with to a large degree. That's the first point. But the second point is that we do know when animals are suffering. Um, we, can, we know, for instance, that they have Virtually all species, certainly all species of vertebrates, bar none, have pain receptors, produce opiates, have the nervous pathways that transmit pain. So we can say that these animals will suffer if you slash them with a knife, if you confine them into a pen like that, if you took away, if they're a social species, if you take away all others that are like them then I think it's reasonable to suppose. Just as I would suppose that you would suffer in the same way as I would, differently perhaps, 
you know, some people are more social. Some people can survive being on their own for much longer. But there are, still, I think we can probably talk about common ground. Of course, that's making a certain number of philosophical assumptions, but I will never belong to the pure scepticism school, so. <laughs> so maybe subjectivity is not the right word. It's the word that... I can, I, can measure, I can measure suffering. I can see that the animal, or me, or if, whoever... Well, okay, <laughs> I'm going to say that I... I think that Francoise was looking at the, the subjectivity of the animals in the sense of she was trying to get people to recognize something that was inside the animal. Um, and for that, but also I think she was doing something that was important politically. Don't forget you're talking about scientists who are very pundit. And like I said, we all we were all trained. It, you cannot you, you only measure what you can observe. And what you observe is the animal does X, then it does Y. You can't see what it's feeling, therefore feelings do not exist. That's how I was raised, that's how most people who were trained in ethology were raised. Anthropomorphism is the biggest sin of all. And what's nice about the, the way things are changing now is that some scientists are now beginning to talk about animal subjectivity in relationship to animal welfare, and beginning to say, well, Maybe you do need some anthropomorphism because how do you know what an animal is, or any, like the conversation we just had, how do you know what an animal is feeling unless you can project something of your own feelings in the first place? Uh, I, think, I also think that, anyway, I understand your, your discourse now, but I think that, for example, the example of the pig. The people didn't know the week before was much more a projection that's quite different if you analyze, for example, uh, the cat or the dog, that you know them and yeah. you know how they work and you know their reactions, you can understand something. Yeah. So, okay, the, the feeling cannot be exactly the same, but like with other people. But if it's just a picture of an animal that you have never seen before, you're completely projecting your image of what is. Uh, Sadness or what is that? Well, no, it's not, not just that, because you, we do come to, even looking at pigs or tigers or something, we've all spent a lifetime looking, even if we live in cities and we're not seeing much of pigs, but we all see programmes on the television with voiceovers telling you what the animals are doing. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that come to it, you know. <laughs> we don't come to it that naively. <laughs> Oh look, it's a picture of me. We bring with it a whole lot of other stuff. After that, I want to basically, when you were talking about the difficulty of bringing accountability and uh, doing classification with animals, I was thinking that it's not the only one area in which there is this problem. For example, if you work with babies or if you work with uh, people with uh, strong disability, all the same uh, problem uh, exists. And, uh, and probably uh, observation and uh, interaction, looking at interaction, uh, could be a, a techniques also to, to analyze what, what's going on, what's happening. Sure. But, uh, sometimes uh, we give a lot of importance to verbal uh, expression, but sometimes not verbal communication can be analyzed. Yeah. Could be one tool of, of analysis. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you know, I put a lot of emphasis on that because it has been emphasised so much in feminist literature, but I think it's difficult. But there are some situations in which it's extremely difficult to really be accountable. Down the line, you never can be. I mean, all you can do is, even if you're doing research with, you know, well-informed adults and you've given them consent forms, the end of the day, you still take that away and do something with it. You will write the book, not them, usually. Um, I thought that's a really interesting question from your partner. <laughs> so I would like to... <laughs> <laughs> so I have to... Oh, it's on now. Um, 
let me see if I can um, get the question together. What I was actually wondering um, with this example, for example, if animals can feel pain and also if we are only interpreting uh, what an animal is feeling when we, for example, work with uh, an animal. And, you know, I mean, like, first of all, we have experiences with animals where we feel as if I share something with the animal and that I can, according to that sharing, um, say something about what kind of relationship we are uh, actually building up together. So, um, and this leads me maybe to another question and that would be maybe focusing on the human being as an animal and what our feelings actually are and if we are only having a subjectivity that is actually, that we cannot, um, that we only share with ourselves in some ways or maybe we have just words to confer it or is there something that is actually much more beyond us, for example, having compassion, is that something, um, if an animal is in pain, one could say like, okay, I can sense that because I can feel compassion with it. And is, for example, this um, feeling, is that something that is only subjective or is there, for example, some biological research that says that compassion is something where I'm actually engaging in a situation? 